Hi guys and welcome to Fat Pack Magic. Today we're going to do another mailbag opening video, so let's get right to it. First up we got Stoneforge Mystic. Everyone loves Stoneforge Mystic, but it's been going through a tough time lately. It's value going up and down and all because of this banless game that Watsy is playing. Now a lot of people are going, oh my god, Stoneforge Mystic would be amazing in this format. Not really! In a format where you can have a turn 3 Karn or is it Phoenix is running around blasting everybody's face off, Stoneforge Mystic just doesn't do enough. On its best day in Modern, the best thing it can do is search out a Batter Skull and put it into play on turn 3. Maybe turn 2 if you get a nut straw with Mox Opal or something. That's not where this Stoneforge Mystic is going. This Stoneforge Mystic is going directly into the cube. Creeping Tar Pit. Ultimate Box Topper Mastery Edition! What? Okay, so this isn't the most exciting box topper I've ever opened. And sure, you might be kind of pissy if this was your box topper, given that it's maybe $40. But on the whole, I really love the box topper idea. I really think that's a cool gimmick. And I really hope that when they bring the master sets back, they also bring back the box toppers. To be fair, I think the box topper idea was the saving grace of Ultimate Masters. Ultimate Masters is a great draft set and it's a lot of fun. I recommend it to play it if you haven't done it yourself, but the box topper really justified the $250 price tag if you opened a decent box topper. Now they're saying they're gonna shelve the Masters idea thing for a while, which I think is a really good thing. It should be shelved for two years. How premium is something if it's coming out every four to six months? Pack Rat. Talk about a divisive card. In a cube where I have Jace the Mind Sculptor, Survival of the Fittest in Genesis shenanigans, and good old Jite, who knew that Pack Rat would be the card to freak people out? I think a lot of people just have Return to Ravnica post traumatic stress disorder or whatever, because back in the original Pack Rat draft format, it was strong and it was incredible, but there was also not a lot of removal for it. You drop that on turn two, and unless you got something like really quick, like Is It Charm or something, it'll take over the game. But in a vintage cube, there are so many more answers, so many more board wipes. Sure, Pack Rat is great. But do you really want to discard your Liliana the Veil to have two bears on turn three? For the most part, Pack Rat is great, but I think where it really shines is where it's a reanimation enabler. Celestial Colonnade, arguably the best man land to hold the title. This card pissed off so many people. When Jace was unbanned, it skyrocketed over 60 bucks. And then it turned out Azorius Control wasn't doing as well as people really hoped it would. But even still, it leveled off between like 55 and 60 bucks. And then Ultimate Masters came around and tanked the price. You can get one now for around 25 bucks. In all honesty though, I picked up one of the box hopper versions because it's worth it. And those are the real gem investment cards of the Ultimate Masters sets. Although to be fair, you probably shouldn't trust me with your investment advice. There's a whole subreddit called MTG Finance that you should check out. Although I'd be worried about trusting them too because one guy promised me that Umazawa's Jite was going to be unbanned and I went out and bought three play sets of them. You guys wanna buy any jits? Birds of Paradise. Man, and this is the best art version of it too. Foiled out, art by Therese Nielsen, and this was a buy a box promo. This is the kind of things that we should be getting when we do buy a box. Seriously, look at this art. This is the best art for Birds of Paradise, hands down, no question about it. All five colors of mana represented in the plumes of the tail. The five mana symbols in the box? Art by Therese Nielsen on top of that? I know I already said that, but still, this is the best one. Like, there is no other one. Yeah, sure, Ravnica looks great. It's a crane, cool. The seventh edition one, yeah, sure, looks fine. But no, this is a really good one. This is the best one. Featuring Kiara, the crashing wave, all right. And Glint Sleeve Siphoner, all right. Total cost combined, $12, all right. Yeah, super exciting. But in all honesty, Kiora is really great as a cube planeswalker. She's fine in Commander too. The foil was $11, so it wasn't like, oh man, I gotta really shell out and save up for this one. And if you're looking to buy a Glint Sleeve Siphoner in foil, it's a dollar. No, seriously, it's literally a dollar. Go pick it up. There's no reason not to. If this jumps up in some weird fringe format, you're going to be kicking yourself if you wanted the foil one. So go buy it now. Go to your local game store and be like, I'm going to buy it for a dollar and you're going to be the high roller who bought the Glint Sleeve Siphoner. 
Yeah, okay, let's just pretend you guys didn't see the Sword of Feast and Famine in the corner so we can pretend to be really excited for this foil Natural Order. How about that? Come on. Natural Order is a great card, and it's one of the cards that I really wanted to use to soup up green in a vintage cube. So here's a question I have for you guys in the comment section. What would be the super overpowered cards for the other colors? We know that blue has Ancestral Recall, Time Twister, Time Walk, but what would be like the really strong cards for black, red, or green, or white? So let me know what you guys think. It might actually end up as part of the mailbag or even in the cube. What's kind of funny is Anime Dead is one of those cards that's actually fair in a vintage cube. It's just genuinely good. You can build around a reanimator strategy or you just have an awesome two drop that brings back your biggest creature. But that's actually what I was really going for when I designed this vintage cube. I wanted it to be something where you could draft any card and it was just viable in your deck. Sure, with this kind of strategy, you're going to miss out on huge enablers like Putrid Imp, but I think the trade-off of omitting a niche card like Putrid Imp is that you're going to be able to get cards in that go in almost any deck that drafts them, like Midnight Reaper. It also increases the wow factor when you draft it. How did this card get passed? How did it wheel? It also makes cutting cards for your 40 card deck a bit more of a skill test. And you get more options for fine tuning your sideboard. Sword of Light and Shadow. Every old school player and every commander player knows these swords. And for good reason. These swords are game changers. There have been a couple times when I've drafted them in cube, and one time I got Sword of Light and Shadow and Sword of Fire and Ice in the same cube pack. In a vacuum, Sword of Fire and Ice is infinitely better, but with white and black being top removal in cube and being able to recur your biggest threat, I have to admit, semi-shamefully, I picked the Sword of Light and Shadow. And what do you know, the other card in this package is Sword of Fire and Ice. I'm just gonna kinda gush on how much I love the art on these swords. When they reveal that they did new sword art by the same artist with the same style for the original two swords, ah, oh, I, I freaked out. Like I bought a case of the original Modern Masters and I was just so sad because I never got to open that foil sword and I wanted to so bad. Screw foil goif. Foil Sword of Fire and Ice is just the, like, look at, look at the weight and the, the little fire and the little ice and it's so good. Ah, I'm gonna have to put this down. Otherwise, I'm gonna not be able to stop freaking out. Okay, that's it for me, guys. Thank you so much. Make sure to like and subscribe and may all your packs be fat.